So now that we have seen many other examples of maps, we return to the question of cartographic design. Design is important within maps so you can effectively transmit the information to your chosen audience. In this short lecture, we'll look at some basic principles of map making and discuss how to generate your own maps. This will be a particular service to your dissertation. Generally, when you describe a place, we expect an accompanying map. You will be learning the basics of GIS in a later module, but this module will allow you to produce a map that is generally fit for most purposes. After all of the discussions of decolonized maps and ordnance survey biases, don't worry about it too much at this point. We'll walk before we can run. One of the primary principles is to make maps people want to look at. It is generally easy to make a map, so make a nice one. In this, you must consider your audience while equally considering your source, that is, the information that you wish to transmit. This is one of my favorite maps, that of the Mississippi River Meander Belt, mapped by Harold Fisk in 1944. The floodplain was important for agriculture, industry, and a transportation route. Knowing the alluvial patterns of rivers was important, and as you can see, the river, Mississippi River meandered quite a bit. This might have presaged some of the poor planning that was subsequently done around the Mississippi River and helped with flooding, but just because you make a map doesn't mean people will follow it. It is important, of course, to have accuracy and honesty in your map making. There are more and less subtle versions of this. On the left side, we have an improbable Egypt taking the place of Iraq, for reasons best known to Fox News. On the right-hand side, we have the Mercator projection, created in 1569, which is a very common but highly inaccurate map of the globe. As you can see from the GIF, the actual size of many of the countries depicted is considerably smaller than they are shown. The cylindrical projection of the map was useful for nautical navigation since every line on the sphere is a constant course. The sizes of the land masses become increasingly distorted the further away from the equator they get. The Mercator map inadvertently inflates the sizes of Europe and North America, Canada and Russia. Land masses such as Australia and Indonesia appear much smaller than they actually are. As I said, Africa appears much smaller than it actually is in comparison to other land masses, which, as you can see from the graphic on the right, Many can actually fit neatly within Africa, and this tends to look a little bit, well, racist. Finally, make sure that your map data is describing what you actually think it is describing. From this comic, you can see that these geographic profile maps all appear to show geographic clusters of activity, but really they are just showing population density. The next principle is visual contrast. Make a crisp, clean, sharp-looking map where the feature stands out. If you choose to make a subtle map, then ensure the information that you wish to put forward pops out, and features that have less contrast belong together. The map on the far left is good, if a little stark, and the next two have fairly poor contrast, but the third has just enough. The last two show gradations of color that coordinate to relative density of population, so use similar colors to show relationships. Another principle is legibility. Your labels must be clear and use good decision making when selecting symbols. Think about color use and mitigate for red-green color blindness. We'll talk more about designing for accessibility in another lecture. Make font choices that are clear and easy to read. In image A, you see the labels for the states are too small, while they are okay in image B. In image C, the dots do not represent volcanoes quite as well as in image D. For extremely bad examples of legibility, these two maps show Europe and dialect areas of North America. On the left, you see there are too many labels, contours, and colors. On the right, the legend shows the complexity of the subject, with colors, patterns, and lines inscribing the various dialect regions. Great design comes from simplicity. And it's noted that it is not what you put in that makes a great map, but what you take out. Reduce distractions. Resist trying to put too much into one image. And think about scale. Do you want to show movement between continents, within an island, a few houses on a street? But do keep in mind that you must show some context. 
Think also about how you can visually separate a figure in the foreground from an amorphous background. It helps to focus attention. You can add different elements such as a drop shadow or feathering. See though in examples A and B, both of these are poor regarding contrast and color choice. Better are D, E, and F, though honestly I'm not that keen on E. Try to balance your figure in the center of the page and leave room for a legend, title, scale, and north arrow. A good map can be a visual argument. Try to evenly distribute the information regarding the map while leaving the map itself in the middle. And, of course, always have a legend, particularly with archaeological maps. Maps are looked at very closely, and visual presentation is a category within the grade descriptors for most assessments here at York. Finally, how to make a map. We return to our intrepid all-female survey crew. If you have an alliday and a plane table, you can try to make a map the old-fashioned way. In fact, I'd encourage experimenting with other ways to make a map. You can learn a lot about the landscape, but also how map makers in the past organized and understood space. And obviously there are a number of ways that archeologists can use maps and we'll be learning them in this and other modules. However, many people have made maps that are now extremely easy to use and manipulate. You can use Google Maps or Google Earth. Google is visually very familiar to most people and it is relatively easy to screenshot images with pins dropped at various points, though compared to some of the other map tools, it is relatively difficult to isolate the information that you want to represent in an elegant way. Ordnance Survey Open Data is another option, which gives you the much-discussed Ordnance Survey maps, and you can download vector versions of them, which you can then manipulate with graphic software. These are generally nice at multiple scales, and are again very visually familiar to British audiences. Note that you can sign up for a free trial at your own risk, and there is aerial 3D imagery and augmented reality, so you can pan the landscape with your phone or tablet to see what's nearby. I haven't tried it. In the interface, you can include or exclude many elements, but none of them are particularly useful to archaeologists besides castles and historic houses, and we generally know where those are anyway. The British Geological Survey website is a fantastic resource with the Geology of Britain, Groundwater Levels Timeline from 1970 to Present, and the UK Soil Observatory. As you see in the right-hand side, the bedrock in parts of York is Triassic Sandstone and Conglomerate. Soilscapes is another great resource, and you can export soils data for your GIS. The soil under the King's Manor, for example, is slightly acid loamy and clayey soils with impeded drainage with moderate to high fertility. But finally, Digimap is the most useful mapping tool for this module. As you see, it brings together aspects of the other services, such as the Ordnance Survey, Geology, and Environmental Resources. You can access it through the University of York, as we have an account, so I'll go ahead and show you around the site a bit.